Ladies and gentlemen, Gold Coast Waves Entertainment is very proud to present multi-talented Hollywood celebrity, Mr. Brett Eidman. And welcome to the Gold Coast Waves Entertainment. And today it's an absolute pleasure to be talking with acclaimed Hollywood celebrity, Mr. Brett Eitman. And welcome to the show, Brett. Hi, Tim. How are you? I'm doing just great. Just doing great over here in Australia. Um, how would you describe your life as an actor, director, writer, and comedian? Can you tell us all about you? Well, it's, it's a little bit all over the place. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate that very much. Um, I, uh, my life is like all over the place, you know, it's, it, it's, um, it'd be nice if there was a little continuity to, to what I'm doing, but it's like, I'm doing this and doing that. And, 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 um, I think as time goes on a little bit more, um, it will become a little bit more focused. And, um, so right now it's like a lot of, you know, a lot of scrambling and, um, and with the business, with the coronavirus and everything else, there's like this, there's not much going on so um you know you get a little bit of work but that not not really that much going on everything's on the uh, hiatus yep absolutely yep i was going to actually ask you about the corona and how that had affected you but you've covered it there um how did you come into this career uh, brett um i my my dad was always uh into comedy and um and and he uh, was the first person to like, you know, say to me like, oh, you got to watch these guys on Saturday night in, in, in 1975 with Saturday Night Live. And, and um, so and he was a very funny guy and he was just really super smart. And um, so he got me into it and I was watching all these late night shows, even when I was a little kid. Um, and I just loved comedy. Um, I remember him buying me comedy records and. Um, but never pushed me into show business. And then, then one night I just like, you know, was thinking about it and I was like, I'd like to try some stand up. And, um, I went out and I did stand up. And of course, when you first go out and do stand up, you're terrible. And, um, then I started to take classes, you know, in, in acting and started to, to write and act and, you know, when it gradually, you know, set you on your path. Wonderful. Uh, how would you describe your acting style, Brett? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. I get, I get, I get cast in a lot of like blue collar kind of, uh, kind of roles. And, and, and sometimes it's a little bit more of like a, like a tough guy type of thing. Um, or maybe ethnic background, even though I'm not Italian, but they, they put me in like a, kind of like a tough guy kind of, kind of roles. So, um, I actually really enjoyed that type, you know, the, the, uh, the mafia kind of, kind of roles. And, and, um, and I think that kind of suits the way I am in a sense that, um, not that I'm a bad person, but I, it just, the way I talk and, and my mannerisms and stuff lend itself to that type of thing. I, I'm never cast in a role that like, that plays this powerful, huge corporation owner, you know, that type of thing. They don't do that for me, but I'll be one of the guys working for that guy, you know? Right. Yeah, you know, so uh, that's that's and that's fine with me. I enjoy that a lot. And of all the roles roles that you've played uh, so far, which one would you say was your favorite? Uh, there's been a couple. There's um, the one I did with I, I I did a comedy piece with Bruce Willis. I had so much fun doing, um, where I actually played Bruce Willis. Um, his um, is like a photo double of Bruce Willis, and and we're back and forth and and. It was just fun because uh, you know, I never, well, I've worked with big celebrities before, but but he was like you know, probably like the biggest, and it was just nice to get that that role. And um, I've also done um, different comedy videos for um, Funny or Die and, and um, this yep. this uh, company called uh, We the Internet, where we just did a piece um, that was um, a parody of the um, the Irishman. And once again, I was playing a mafia guy, and, and it was just so much fun. So those those are those are like my favorite roles. It sounds awesome. Uh, in comedy, where do your ideas come from? Um, they they come from just thinking about stuff, like constantly thinking of, of just looking at things and just thinking about. It. I don't I don't know when something's going to come to me, um, but I just think it requires to keep your mind busy and to keep 
you know, observing and, and I, for me, it's almost like, um, like association. It's almost like if I see one thing and it, it reminds me of something else. And um, I think it's just basically opening up your head and, um, and letting these thoughts in. And, and um, you know, so they, I don't necessarily sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write some funny things now. Or I'm going to write this, write that. I will think of something, you know, it will just pop into my head out of nowhere. And then I'll say, well, that's an interesting thought. And, and then if I want to expand on it, that's when I would sit down and actually just write the rest of it out. Right. Uh, how do you feel when you win an award? Uh, can you tell our listeners about some of the awards that you've won? Um, I, I, there was one award, one of the early ones I, that I won at a, um, a famous uh, New York City comedy club uh, called The Comic Strip. And it was basically, um, I, didn't, I didn't think I was going to win. I just did the best I could. And, and, um, but when I did win, I was shocked. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, I don't know, it was never really in my head to say, oh, I'd love to win awards, love to win awards. I just, um, sure, it's really nice to win an award, but I don't really, it's not part of what I envision, you know, with like with, with doing work and stuff. Oh, I hope if I do this, I'm going to get an award. And um, then I, uh, my first kind of award that really um, caught me way off guard was an award that I, I won at a film festival for best documentary. And when I was the subject of the documentary and, and I totally like was just, I mean, I was like, I was shocked. I was shocked to be nominated, which they just told you like right before the film festival that you were nominated, like really. And then I didn't, I said, you know, to myself that, okay, don't dwell on this or don't, you're not going to win. So relax. So I go to the award ceremony and you win and it's surreal. It's, um, it's a, a very surreal feeling and um, it's bizarre because I don't, you know, you know, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't, I try not to let my head go to those places where, gee, I hope I win this award. I hope I, you know, and um, so I've won a bunch of film festival awards and then the, uh, the stand up award, a couple of stand up awards. And, but those are like really not something that I go after. If it, if it happens, it's a wonderful thing, but it's not something that I, I just strive to be the best that I can. You know, what's the most important quality in being a film director? Actually, what do you look for in a script? Well, in a, in a script, I just try to like make sense of the script. Um, when when I read a script, I really try to just imagine, okay, where is this? Who is this? What's going on here? What's what's the tone? And um, there have there have been scripts that I've read that to me, even after reading it a couple of times, I still don't really understand what exactly is going on. And um, but if something is is clear and or if it's funny or real serious and it really it has a beginning a middle and an end and it flows then um you know that then i can really dive into it i, I did a play several years ago where the script really didn't make sense and it was so hard to memorize lines that don't make sense when lines make sense it's it's a lot easier because it makes sense and um so i look for just Figuring out, okay, what is the tone of this whole thing? What is the point? Uh, where are we going with this? And and where do we want the audience to go? And, you know, I have to be able to see that pretty clearly in the script. When it comes to directors, um, I think that I love the low-key directors. I love the guys that are just um, guys or, or women who um, basically will be laid back and they'll discuss with you um, different ways that they think um, the action should be or how you should how you should act in this in this certain situation plus you could bring your own ideas to the table and and um, just they just have to be just so open-minded have to know what they're doing but they need to be open-minded and need to be very calm I think those are the real great directors are, are like that excellent uh, what's the most uh, spontaneous thing you've ever done oh um it's a little unrelated to show business. Um, uh, one was by a boat. <laughs> um, I just, um, I saw a boat that I loved and I wanted my family to, to enjoy a boat. And then I just bought a boat. So I, um, that was, um, that was spontaneous because I didn't really spend much time getting information together. Um, and that worked out just fine. Um, I also just recently about four and a half years ago, 
uh, came up with an idea for an invention and, and I, um, I said, I'm going for it. And I've been working on it for four and a half years and, and it's called ProMat 99. So that's kind of spontaneous because I didn't expect to go that route. I'd never invented anything before. And um, it kind of, um, it just, it took over my thought process and, and I'm learning in, learning as I go and making my mistakes and learning from my mistakes and they just keep, keep plugging away. You know, so those are spontaneous kind of things. I I try not to do too many things spontaneously, but every once in a while, you you have to. That's amazing. You're really multi-talented. Uh, I didn't even realize that. Well, thank you. I, I try hard. <laughs> are there are there any goals that you haven't achieved as yet uh, in your career that you'd still like to achieve? Yes. Um, make a living. No, that, that would be a nice goal. Um, I would like to, my goal is to basically um, break things down and, and, and uh, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a, a sitcom, um, I'd, I'd love to be on a series. I, you know, I've done different spots on different shows, but I haven't um, had a recurring role on a TV series. That I would love to do. That's a goal that I would that I've had for a while. I don't know if I'll ever attain that, but I I'm, would love it. And I have a manager who keeps trying. But you know, like we said before, the coronavirus the coronavirus has slowed everything down. Um, I'd also like to see my my product take off and 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 do well. And um, so those are those are goals. So I just want to just kind of. Um, uh, kind of slim things down with my like with my schedule be a little bit more focused on things that i'm doing i think that would be a goal of mine and settle settle it down a little bit okay and uh what movie can you practically practically quote from start to finish <laughs> um there's a couple of them i don't know if this is popular over in australia or in other parts of the world but there's a movie called 1776 um which is all about the american revolution and it's a, it's a musical um I just love, I, I, I've, been, I've loved that movie since I was a little kid and I watch it every single time I see it on TV. I have it on DVD. And um, so 1776 is just amazing movie. Um, of course, Blazing Saddles, mm -hmm. Mel Brooks film. I mean, that, that, that mm -hmm. I could I know a lot of those lines. And um, yeah, I think those two, Blazing Saddles and 1776 are, are ones that I really know. Yeah, I love I love Mel Brooks. Lovely, lovely stuff. <laughs> oh, he's incredible. He's really, really amazing talent. Yep. Uh, and we need to tell the listeners as well, you're regularly seen on SNL, uh, Nickelodeon, and Comedy Central as well. Um, do you have any upcoming shows? You know, I know there wouldn't be too many coming up, you know, with the coronavirus and everything, but um, do you have any upcoming shows you'd like to tell us about? Well, I... Um the shows that I've been doing have been like online. I've been doing like improv and sketch shows online. Um, mm -hmm. They're not, <laughs> this is not such a great plug, but they're not as good as seeing something live. That's for sure. Because there are technical glitches and there's delays. And like, sometimes it's, this doesn't run as smooth as a live performance and um, everything else has been put on hold. I, um, I have a couple of, um, I have a, um, a TV pilot that's supposed to come out, but they're not putting it out until the virus is over. There's a film I did that, that, that is not coming out until the virus is over. Um, yep. so a whole bunch of things that I'm waiting for, um, you know, to come out. And so right now there's, there's really not much going on except on the weekends. I, I'll, I'll do a, um, like I said, a sketch, like this weekend, I'm doing a, uh, a reading of, um, of some comedy sketches with a, with an improv, a local improv group, a little north of New York City, and um, I'll be doing that. And then uh, there's uh, an improv show that I'm going to be doing. But these are all are, are being done on Zoom, and yep. it's not that exciting. Uh, it's more just to keep the performers, um, just to kind of keep them in sync a little bit and to keep them kind of like um, warmed up. And, and so we just, this way we don't um, get rusty and stale and so – but for an audience to view it and stuff, it's not it's not that entertaining um, to watch because it's so small, you know. But, yep. but we have to do the best we can with with the uh, the situation because it is it is horrible. 
I, even, even though I think in Australia, they haven't had it as bad as, as other areas, which is really nice. Yeah, no, we've been lucky in that regard. Uh, we need to tell the listeners as well uh, and congratulate you and wish you for your birthday, which just happens to be today. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, my time. Yeah, it's my birthday. Yep. <laughs> Thank we, you. We, we wish you. We wish you a very, very happy birthday. And uh, on behalf of Oya Wilson and myself, We'd like to thank you very, very much for coming on to our show. It's been an absolute honor and pleasure talking to you, Brett. Same here, Tim. And thank you so much for having me on. And I hope that uh, you guys stay, you know, healthy and safe and, and um, all the best. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Tim. Talk to you soon. Yep. You take care, Brett. It's been lovely. Thank okay. you. Right, bye-bye. Okay. Bye now. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, the legendary Beatles. I have to tell you, this is the most unique, uh, most incredible, magnificent collection that I've ever seen. Possibly uh, the best Beatle collection I, I have ever seen. This is unbelievable, and I am so happy that you, you brought it in today. Um, the Beatles, the biggest influence on pop music ever. I don't think there's a group that's performing today that weren't influenced by the Beatles. Um, they changed the world. They changed the way people dressed. They changed, people used to have their mop tops, they, the, the way that they had their hair. It's the Beatles. And when it comes to collectibles and memorabilia, there's nothing more popular than the Beatles. And this collection is just absolutely magnificent. And, um, I really would like to know, how in the world did you attain this? Well, there's a, there's a story behind that. Uh, my uncle was a, 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 a ball, a bat boy? Bat boy. Bat boy. Uh, for the, at Shea Stadium in 1964 or 5. And when they had this concert, they, they played baseball before the concert with the Mets. Oh, so the Beatles played the Mets before their concert. Yeah, about, and they beat them. They beat the Mets. Yeah, they weren't very good that year. Wow. Uh, I and, never heard this story. I mean, this the Beatles didn't even know how to play baseball, and they uh, they came in, and my my uncle was able to come in and get get a autograph for balls. That's and they're in magnificent shape. I mean, this is this know. is incredible. Um, have you ever had this collection appraised? My uncle and father did about 15 years ago, right. and I, I think they got it appraised at about 150 grand. 150 thousand dollars. Well, um, do you have that appraisal? I don't. You don't have it because okay. I didn't. I didn't do it personally. Okay. And how about a? I guess a certificate of authenticity. You wouldn't. Um, you know, okay. No, my uncle didn't didn't get them to sign that. That makes sense. Um, well, I think that that was a conservative appraisal. I mean, I think that, um, and plus with time, these type of items go up in value. Um, you have George Harrison and John Lennon are unfortunately no longer with us. Um, yeah. So you can't get their signatures anymore. No. Um, Ringo Starr, stop signing uh, things. He, he did? He doesn't, want to, he doesn't sign autographs anymore, so, so he's out of the picture. So you have Paul McCartney and try to get a hold of Paul McCartney, that's, diff that's very difficult. So <laughs> this is a one-of-a-kind uh, collection. I would say, at auction, this collection, and I'm being conservative, would go for about three hundred to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's, and I'm being conservative. You, there, there are Beatle fans, fanatics, that it could even go higher than that. Um, so I'm just saying, I'm, it's being very conservative, and I think what you have here is a one of a kind collection. Sure. Um, now, if you notice, with these signatures here. Right there, the John Lennon, he makes a face. You know, you're an asshole. What? This is, that's not his. That's his signature. Yeah. Uh, he's, you know, this is all for, you know, I, I thought you looked familiar. You've been on the show before, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, this is bullshit. Get off the show. 
What? Get off the show. This no, is, this is, is real. fake. This is this, real. This is not real. It's this all horseshit. Get the fuck off the show. I swear, I, let me tell you something. If you come back on this show again, I will take these baseballs and I'll ram them so far up your ass, you'll be shit and rawhide for the rest of your life. Now get the fuck off. Turn off the camera, please. You get the fuck off. Yeah, take that and put that in your head, you stupid ass. Stupid. Antiques Roadshow, only on PBS.